I am Mitch Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Aftakar Aslam of YieldWorks. Going to talk today about advanced part average testing. Aftakar, what's changing in advanced part average testing? What's different now versus, say, two years ago or three years ago? Great. So there's traditional part average test that's been around for uh, donkeys of years, right? Ever since the interlock brake systems were basically built back in the day. Right, and the whole game is being able to eliminate high-risk dye. But those methods were, you know, using robust mean, robust sigma kind of like methods. Products were probably simpler back then. Products became more and more complex. The criticality of the products or the applications that products are going into are becoming more and more critical. So what we are basically doing in this space is saying, hey, what other elements of outlier control can we introduce? that works on the data that being that is being collected for this advanced products and devices that minimizes the risk of you know shipping assembling high risk die okay so it's a combination right one is the amount of data the complexity of the devices and the criticality of the applications the devices are going into are, are basically asking for hey i need better ways of identifying could die right that were tested as good but may have something wrong with them that are considered outliers based on the actual data signatures themselves, right, that we want to basically eliminate. Let's take a closer look. Yes, let's do that. Aptcar, what are we looking at? Yeah. Are we looking at over here? Let's let's assume that we have a wafer, and if I use my pen over here, let's uh, color some of these dyes. So let's say these, uh, these dye over here I'm coloring are all known good dye, right? Um, and on those non-good dye, I'm basically doing one of the you know, leakage tests. And based on my leakage test results, I get a nice, I get a nice band, uh, what we say, a ghost in distribution of data. And my ghost in distribution of data uh, basically fits um, within the upper control limit and lower control limit. Okay. Now, traditional part average test assumed that the actual data is going to be always Gaussian in nature, right? A Gaussian curve. But in reality, that does not happen. There are process issues that can occur. Uh, they could be theoretically radical issues, design issues, um, maybe even assembly and test issues where your data is not going to fit into a normal uh, curve like this, right? So what we do in advanced path is we actually look at the signature of the data. And from looking at the signature of the data, we determine what different rules uh, to apply to the data to eliminate those good dye. The leakage test is really about testing the signal that's going into the device and out of the device, right? So you want that signal to be as strong coming in as you do coming out. Exactly, yeah. So traditionally, there's like, you know, eight to 10 different test types that, that people care about when it comes to applying outlier quality control rules. Leakage test just happens to be one of the most commonly used tests that people uh, apply part of this test to. But it could be any parameter. It could be, hey, I'm feeding in a frequency. I want to measure the frequency coming out. I'm putting in a voltage or a current, right? I'm now with photonics devices. I could be feeding in a light signal, for example, and I'm now measuring the light that's being emitted let's say from a, you know, an LED diode kind of product. So to us, it doesn't really matter what the actual test is. It's basically, hey, based on the test specs, based on the measurements being made uh, for that dye, yeah, it still is a good dye, but with those measurements within the normal distribution, right, of other known good dye. And if they weren't, where, did they belong to a different signature? And that's where advanced part average test looks at the actual data and say, yeah, if you don't exhibit a normal Gaussian distribution, you're exhibiting a different signature. And that test has become increasingly critical too, right? Because if you think about it, we're moving down into advanced nodes, the dimensions are becoming tighter and tighter. You're dealing with thinner dielectrics, potentially thinner dye. The flip side of that is you're also dealing with potentially more elements or more interconnects that have to go into these devices. Yes. Any leakage that's coming out there over time as these devices are used more intensively than they were in the past can cause problems down the road. Exactly, yes, correct. So what kind of signatures are you actually dealing with here? Yeah, great question. So let's assume I have a wafer and my wafer was processed on a piece of equipment and it introduced some kind of process issues. So process issues could be, hey, on this part of my wafer over here, 
my thickness was, let's say, one arm strong or whatever unit of measurement we want to use, thicker than the rest of the way for OVA, just because it was, uh, you know, a spin uh, element of uh, dispositioning material on a wafer. So now I have basically zonal issues, right? I have, this is my center over here. I could have dial over here that exhibit a different behavior, right? From these dial over here that's in the center of the wafer, even though they were tested as good dye. So this is what we call a zonal issue or a bimodal issue. Now, so if I go to the next slide, this is typically what we would see in terms of signatures. You could have uniform data, you could have a way bull signature, you could have a chi squared signature, you could have log normal signatures. And in the example I just drew on the previous slide, I could have multimodal signatures as well, where my dye on the actual wafer exhibit two different curves over here. Now, when I first started explaining part of race test, I said the traditional method was looking at a standard distribution over here. Right. So, but this standard distribution over here really masks the problem, right? It says, hey, I'm going to treat my data as a normal distribution and I can apply my limits over here. I can apply my limits over here. But what it's not doing is saying, hey, okay, so what is my distribution? This is the most frequently one that we see actually log normal and multimodal are the most frequent signatures that we see that get masked out by traditional part average test uh, solutions that exist out there. So what we do is we are able to, first of all, plot the actual data, then look at, hey, what signatures that we have, and then apply the limits by the signature type. So in this case, I only had two sets of limits, right? I had a part average test upper limit and a part average test lower limit. In this case over here, I would be applying four sets of limits, right? Uh, an upper limit, lower limit for the first node, an upper limit and lower limit for the second node. Right. And that, what that allows me to do is allows me to screen out non-good dye from each of the nodes versus over here, they may have escaped because they were buried in this massive Gaussian curve over here. That granularity is really what you're able to achieve with this. And you have a lot more data now, so you need the AI in order to manage all that too, right? Correct. So first of all, it's a, a, you know, a really massive amount of data. Now, I'm only telling you about one test. Imagine that you have an advanced product and in that advanced product, let's say you have, you know, a thousand rules, a thousand tests, right, that you want to apply this to, right? So it's a, it's like a domino effect. Okay, you pass the first rule, you pass the second rule, and the third rule, I found a signature, right? So that's one level of complication. The other level of complication is it can change from lot to lot. It can change from wafer to wafer. Traditionally, what happens, people will say, hey, I want to apply a Gaussian distribution rule to my data hey, I want to apply a log normal rule to my actual data. But, you know, what actually happens is over time, I can have high yielding lots and I have a low yielding lot. It's still acceptable. Then I go back to high and I basically have this kind of trend on yield, right? And now what we are able to do is to say, you know what? You told me that my data was going to be a Gaussian, but over here on this lot over here, my data exhibited a bimodal signature. So what your solution does is says, hey, you told me it was going to be a Gaussian distribution. I detected a bimodal signature. Do you want me to apply the Gaussian rule or do you want me to automatically apply the multimodal rule, right? In which case, it would say, okay, hey, I'm going to kill these die. I'm going to kill these die. Maybe I kill some die over here, right? It does it on the fly, so, right? And then it will tell the user, by the way, I overrode your rule. You told me, Gaussian, I self-corrected you, applied multimodal. This is the amount of yield I actually saved you. Uh, this is the amount of yield I actually killed because I eliminated the high-risk die. But the, the solution that we have built is, one, is detecting the signatures. Is then saying, hey, do you want me to force the signature or the rule that you have created um, because you're edicting it? Or do you want me to apply the rule I think is best suited for the actual data. And then, oh, by the way, I'll tell you that I flipped. This is the rule I used so that you know, hey, um, I should either go back and adjust my rules or, hey, what caused this issue over here, right? Was it an anomaly? Should I really be looking at changing from a normal uh, distribution rule to a multi-model distribution rule because all of the material that's coming in from the fab is exhibiting that behavior? right? Until the process guys go off and fix these issues. This is, to the best of my knowledge, something that has not been implemented in other uh, solutions. We have implemented this. And, and the beauty of this is that you can now start to tie high-risk quality outlier control 
and detect these issues over here on the fly and then start doing root cause analysis at the same time. Does it change as we get into things like panels? Uh, so we're thinking about here, what, probably 300 millimeter wafers. Does it change as you go into a panel size and potentially package on panel? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can apply that. We're talking about wafers over here, right, Ed? But you can equally apply this to a package die as well. Of course, the only thing um, we have to be cognizant of there is they have die ID. So, you know, I have to, uh, complete traceability down. You know, this is the package that I want to eliminate because I can read the die ID. Or I can read a, a serial number or signature from the actual device itself. And saying you, you don't exhibit the same behavior as other known good package die as well. So yeah, this applies to uh, full panel displays, package parts. It can be applied, of course, on wafer form. So the solution really can be used in any of those three areas. How does this work with other outlier control units? Great. So uh, we have coupled this with uh, a couple of other modules, uh, solutions around outlier control. Noticeably, of course, you always have you know SBL, SYL, and SBC rules. We have complemented this with now with a good die, a good die in a bad neighborhood, right? Um, we have implemented this or complemented this with good die in a bad die neighborhood in a cluster. We've also now introduced a solution called zonal pad, right? So zonal pad basically goes up and looks at the actual data and self determines if there actually is zonal issues. And the last one that we're integrated this with is called the NNR. Uh, which stands for nearest neighbor residual, right? So uh, good die in a bad die neighborhood. Um, you know, hey, I'm a good die. Is my neighboring die bad? And what kind of um, what kind of uh, array size am I looking at? So this is my good die over here. Am I looking at neighboring bad die, or am I looking at neighboring bad die that are too deep, right? For example, that's GDBN, right? And GDBN clusters would be, hey, I have uh, you know a signature like this where you know, this is a good die, 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 but I have a bad die and a bad die and a bad die over here. This could be a scratch, right? So I think I'm gonna knock out those die because hey, I'm sitting next to a scratch, for example. The zonal pad, of course, uh, is basically being able to you know, decompose the wafer into zones uh, automatically and saying, you know, hey, you have a zone A over here, you have a zone B over here, you have a zone C over here. You know, known good die in here still, uh, being able to um, being able to apply different limits uh, for the die that belong to zones. And the last one is very similar to a good die in a bad die neighborhood, where we actually look at a a die and we let's say, hey, I'm going to look at your leakage result, and I'm going to look at my neighbor die as well. These are all good neighbors, and my leakage result, my leakage result over here, and saying, hey, my leakage result is off by one percent. Right, uh, it's no longer looking at a bin. It's actually looking at test results and saying, "Hey, my leakage result is off by one percent." Even though I'm a good die, you're a good die, you're a good die, but because my leakage is off by one percent, I'm going to knock myself out of the uh, population. Okay, so all of these elements over here: SBL, SYL, good die, bad die, neighborhood, and a cluster and a zone and nearest neighbor residual are all part of the arsenal ahead of outlier control. Um, an advanced part of average test in EORX. Okay, big thing over here is uh, this solution over here now allows you to go off and automatically look at different signatures of the data versus the traditional method over here. And just to be clear, a known good die, and you're talking about in a bad neighborhood, may not be bad die in that neighborhood. Could be one of the interconnects or many of the interconnects are no longer meeting due to warpage or coplanarity issues, right. things like that, right? Yes, correct. So yeah. Exactly. And the other thing is, of course, you can always, when we downgrade those good die, they don't have to become bad die that you just throw away. They could be used for other purposes. They could be repurposed, right? They can be picked at multiple times, um, doing a multi-pass pick, which is a solution that we also have, where you go back and then you take all your grade A good die and, and assemble them as, you know, the best in class product. And they can go back and look at maybe not bad die, but die that were downgraded for every rule. And say, hey, we can still go off and use those dies, but in different applications, for example, right? And that's where we're saving companies money by saying, hey, you don't have to be just zeros and ones. You can basically have different colors of, of grades of die as well. That's Aslam. Thanks for a great explanation. Yeah, welcome, Ed. Thanks for having us today.